Okay, I think we're uh, I think we're ready to get started. Okay. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Cube LA podcast. I'm sure some of you have, no have noticed things look a bit different. I have uh, have officially switched to all Zoom interviews. We uh, we were able to do about ten to twelve interviews in person, but uh, Los Angeles there's too much COVID in Los Angeles, so <laughs> mm -hmm. small changes had to be made. Um, I have with me today a Dr. Friedman. Say hi there, Dr. Friedman. <laughs> hi, Thomas. How are you? Good I'm evening. doing very well. Very well. Um, that's all the announcements that I actually have. Um, I don't think I have anything else. As I've gone on uh, further along with these interviews, there are less and less announcements for me to have to make. So I guess that's a good thing. <laughs> all right, Dr. Friedman, are you ready to start? I am ready. Thank you, Thomas. All right. Fantastic. <laughs> I'm here with uh, Dr. Friedman, um, an endocrinologist who uh, works in California. Uh, just to give some more information on Dr. Friedman, you graduated from Stanford University in 1980 with a degree in chemistry and biology. You graduated from Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York with an MD PhD in 1987. I have a few friends with uh, MD PhDs. That is a very serious degree you had there, sir. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I, uh, you finished your internal medicine residency in 1989, and you completed a fellowship for endocrinology and a senior staff uh, fellowship in, uh, for endocrinology in 1995. Is that all correct, all accurate? That's correct, at the NIH, correct. And you have written a number of papers, received a number of grants, and held a number of academic positions over your career, uh, which tells me that if I have a question about endocrinology, you would likely have an answer for me. You got it. <laughs> All right, so just to start off, I like to give people a very basic um a very basic understanding of what we'll be talking about today. So, if you could describe to the audience what exactly an endocrinologist does, that would be great. Okay, so endocrinology is a study of hormones and glands. So people will come to me with problems with their hormones and glands, and um, you know, there's a lot of different problems and different um endocrinologists may be specialized in certain ones. Um, I was, before I'm just getting started, I have a lot of hats. So I am the chairman of medicine at Charles Drew University in Los Angeles and the chief of endocrinology. So I have an academic hat and we, do, uh, we have a medical school. We're starting a residency program. I also see patients at Martin Luther King Outpatient Center. So I'm actually involved in seeing a large number of patients with endocrine problems. And my third hat is I have a private practice where I see patients basically from all around the country who find me on my website and they come to me with endocrine problems. Um, the endocrine problems I see in my private practice would be what we're talking about primarily tonight would be thyroid problems, pituitary problems. The pituitary is the master gland in the base of their brain, which influences a lot of your body function. Um, your adrenals are glands on this uh, side of your body above your kidneys, and they make several very important hormones. So people come to me, they may have too much of a hormone called uh, cortisol, which gives them a disease called Cushing's disease. They may have too much, they, that could be from their pituitary, it could be from their adrenals. They could have a pituitary tumor, and they could have thyroid problems, which is what we're going to be talking tonight. A lot of people come to see me because the thyroid isn't working. The thyroid also regulates a lot of different body functions, including some of your energy and your, your bowel movements and your hair and your nails. So the, getting the thyroid to work well is important. And then other endocrinologists, including my, me at my uh, MLK job, deal with diabetes. So a lot of people will have diabetes. There's an epidemic of diabetes. And a lot of people would see an endocrinologist because they're having diabetes. Some people see it, including me, for obesity issues. Some obesity may be hormonally mediated. Some, uh, And I have often some suggestions on how to lose weight. So some people come to me for obesity issues. But I think for tonight, we're going to be talking about mostly about thyroid issues. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one thing that I noticed when I was looking up all of your credentials, I mean, you could have gone a number of different directions with your career. I mean, especially mm -hmm. with internal medicine. Um, there's a number of different residencies that you had to choose from. Why did you choose endocrinology? Right. What, so what attracted I, I, you to that? Right. So I think it's a combination of I like the field and I had some really good mentors. So I was an MD, PhD uh, student, as you mentioned, in Mount Sinai, New York. And some of the senior endocrinologists there were very inspirational. A gentleman named Terry Davies, 
a woman, um, um, let me think of her name in a second, Andrea Dunaif. Um, she was the fellow in endocrinology when I was a, a medical student there. She later went on to become the head of the Endocrine Society. And they just really liked what they were doing. They were good role models. I looked up to them. Um, I liked endocrinology because it's sort of a little bit of a detective work. So if somebody has trouble breathing, you know, it's something wrong with their lungs or their heart, basically. If someone has an endocrine problem, it could be their whole body. They can come across being tired. And we don't know whether it's their thyroid or their adrenals or their pituitary or their heart problems or liver problem or kidney problem. So it's a lot of detective work trying to figure out what, um, what's wrong with somebody. And a lot of time, most of the time in endocrinology, you can make people better. Most endocrine conditions are treatable and actually people do very well when they treat their endocrine problems, unlike maybe neurology when people have had a stroke. You know, maybe they'll get a little bit better, but not that much better. So I felt I like the idea about endocrinology. You can be a detective, you can help people, and you can make actually people feel better. Hmm. That makes sense. I uh, One fantastic thing about psychiatry is that uh, there's a lot of investigative work yeah. uh, that goes on with psychiatry, trying to figure out exactly how right. a person got to be who they mm -hmm. were when, when you're meeting them at that time. Because a lot of times people have 50 years worth of history <laughs> right exactly. behavioral problems that you have to that you have to right. try to and they, understand and then when you fix it in one day <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I think it's an interesting i mean i thought a little bit about going into psychiatry um i think one of the things that's different i don't know if it's necessarily better or worse about endocrinology compared to psychiatry is endocrine it's almost all based on labs um you know you do tests if you think somebody has a thyroid problem you do the test and they don't then they don't have it basically so the labs sort of rule in endocrinology and psychiatry, you know, we're starting to do some genetic testing, but psychiatry, it's much more um, objective based or subjective based, you know, it's what the person says, you get a feel, you make a diagnosis based on the clinical. So it's, I, I like the lab based aspect of endocrinology and sort of seeing the numbers and looking at for subtle changes in the numbers. Yeah, absolutely. I do wish that more we had more lab tests to, <laughs> to give us some <laughs> right. of the answers. And I we think, I think there will be some, you know, I think there's, that's the future of psychiatry is to go into more, you know, sort of lab based work. And I think some of the genetics is fascinating and it's really advanced the field a lot. Absolutely. Well, I mean, one of the labs that we typically get uh, mm -hmm. for patients, you know, baseline labs that we try to get, or at least we recommend them highly, is a test of the thyroid. Mm -hmm. um, one of the reasons for that is because thyroid conditions can sometimes appear like psychiatric right. conditions. Exactly. So, I mean, one of those tests that we get, I think I just mentioned it, is the thyroid. Mm -hmm. So uh, you mentioned it briefly, um, you know, during your introduction. But if you could, cause, because I think people have an idea about what the thyroid is. They have some idea, but mm -hmm. they haven't heard it come from a doctor. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. What the thyroid is and why it's important. So if you could tell people, what, why is the thyroid important? Why, would you, why should we care about it? Yeah, so the thyroid is, I would say, a butterfly-shaped gland in your neck area. And it makes two thyroid hormones, T4 and T3. The T3 is the active, the active hormone, but the T4 is important also. And they regulate a lot of your body's function, including metabolism. So people with a low thyroid, and it, you know, it sort of depends on each person. Some people have an underactive thyroid and do fine. Other people are very effective, but some people with a low thyroid can have a slow metabolism, which would lead them to gain weight. They would feel sluggish. They could have hair loss. They can have brittle nails. They have constipation. Um, they are, their reflexes might be slow, so it's probably not that good for them to drive because it might take them a while for that message to go from their brain to their foot to put on the brakes. They're, they act often slow. People with overactive thyroid, which is a little less common, but still fairly common, they would have like their heart might beat fast. They have palpitations. They have sweating. They have diarrhea. They have anxiety. Um, and in both conditions and most inner conditions, there is a lot of psychi psychological and psychiatric manifestations. So as you mentioned, Thomas, a lot of people with uh, underactive thyroid have depression and my uh, mask is depression. The good thing is when you treat their thyroid, depression often gets better. Now, a lot of people have depression, don't have a thyroid problem, but I, I agree with you that we should make sure they don't have a thyroid problem before we give them like heavy duty thyroid, heavy duty psychiatric medicines. Let's um, just make sure they don't have something that's very easily treated. Yeah, I've had uh, I've had colleagues that have, you know, ran those baseline labs and have actually caught someone who had a thyroid mm -hmm. issue and was on, you know, right. on the brink of being medicated. And it's a great yeah. feeling. <laughs> yeah, so I know yeah. what you mean when uh, when, you know, when you when you check labs and there's mm -hmm. your answer right there looking right. at you, you know. Mm -hmm. Right. And um, a lot of thyroid is fairly subtle. You know, some of the other 
the people that are very over underactive, very hypothyroid, you know, you pick do some tests, it's easy diagnosing, you put on medicine. The sort of the problem is sort of the gray area, people that could be hypothyroid, could be normal. Do you want to put them on medicine? Do you not? And that's that's the hard decision. You know, often once they're on thyroid medicines for an underactive thyroid, their own body, their own thyroid stops working and they're replaced by the exogenous thyroid medicines. And the, the pills aren't as good as the body. If you have a healthy thyroid, you usually don't do worse if you get put on thyroid pills. And some doctors might put people on thyroid medicine for weight loss. It really doesn't work. Um, you, it, it suppresses your own body and you don't make the right thyroid hormones at the right time. So if you're not hypothyroid, you shouldn't go on thyroid medicines. If you are, you should. And that's the job of an endocrinologist like myself is to figure out who should be on it. And I always say I spend half my time figuring out who should go on thyroid medicines and half my time figuring out who was put on them inappropriately and should go off of them. So it's a really a, 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 a difficult decision that you have to look at the labs thoroughly and do the history and you know, really get to know the patient and see what, um, what direction the labs are going is often helpful. Well, I think looking at the labs is important, but you, you need that, that skill set that we got mm -hmm. in, in medical yeah. school. You know, you could easily right. read the labs and misinterpret. Right, exactly. So misinterpret what you're reading. Is, is crucial as well. Absolutely. So, there, I mean, you, you mentioned uh, hypo and hyperthyroid. I mean, there's a condition mm -hmm. called Hashimoto's that I, I, right. I'm remembering from medical school. Uh, we might have briefly, it might have been mentioned between our communications with one another. Could you talk a little bit about Hashimoto's sure. thyroiditis? Sure, what is that? That's an excellent question. So Hashimoto's is a, is a subtype of hypothyroidism, and it's the most common subtype. Most people that truly have hypothyroidism have Hashimoto's. Hashimoto's means the gland is attacked by antibodies. The antibodies start attacking your gland. The gland stops, starts to fail, and the pituitary hormone TSH starts rising. And when the TSH is high, that's the way we diagnose hypothyroidism. But there's going to be some people the TSH is sort of high normal. So let's say the range of TSH is 0.5 to 5. What happens if you get somebody with a TSH of 4.8? They're sort of on the way to being hypothyroid. You try to look at their old labs, maybe the TSH was three the year before, and now it's 4.8. There's a little bit of variability in the measurement. Different times of the day, it's different. Different times of the year, it's different. So you probably a good idea is to repeat it. TSH is, is 4.8 and see where, what direction it's going. But the TPO antibody is crucial in these patients that are borderline. So if somebody has, the, the Hash, has Hashimoto's, they have this positive TPO antibody, the gland is attacked by the antibodies, and their thyroid is, is starting to fail. Their TSH may, may start going up, may not, but that would be somebody that I would describe as a sick gland that probably should go on thyroid medicine sooner than somebody that has a negative TPO antibody and doesn't have Hashimoto's. Now, there is a small percentage of people that have Hashimoto's that don't have the antibodies, and it's often helpful to get an ultrasound. The ultrasound can also tell you whether they have Hashimoto's the way the ultrasound looks. Um, that some people can have the antibodies negative. So sometimes they also get an ultrasound to see if that looks like a Hashimoto's gland, especially for these people that have a TSH of like 4.8 near the top of the range. They have to decide whether I should put people on thyroid medicine or not. So when you, when you, this, this word for, for people that are not, uh, that haven't heard these words before, when you mentioned mm -hmm. this word antibody, mm -hmm. what you're talking about is your, your own body's immune system right. attacking itself. Exactly. So your body's immune system is designed to attack foreign things. So now we're hearing all about COVID vaccines. The COVID vaccines make antibodies to attack the COVID virus infecting the person. It's attacking a foreign thing. That's what antibodies are supposed to do, but they're not supposed to attack your own self. So in people with Hashimoto's, the immune system is off. So these antibodies start attacking the thyroid gland. If patients own antibodies start attacking the thyroid gland and it causes the thyroid gland to start being destroyed. If it goes on, it, it could, it doesn't always happen that it destroys the gland, but in, a, in about 50% of the time, people with the antibodies, it goes on to destroy the gland and they have to go on thyroid medicine. Another yeah. percentage of people that they can have the antibodies and not need uh, to go on thyroid medicine. So I think the test is underutilized and really important. Yeah, that's the, the fascinating thing about medicine is the fact that you have things that are working properly, right? Mm -hmm. And then... It, if it goes a little bit too much to the right, mm -hmm. it can become problematic. If it goes a right. little bit too much to the left, it becomes exactly. problematic. Right. 
Right. But everything in our body is actually susceptible to going. Right. Anything that can go right can go wrong. Right. <laughs> right. So I'm a firm believer of being a moderate. Yeah. I'm a moderate in politics <laughs> and I'm a moderate in, 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 uh, in diseases. You know, you want to stay right in the middle, not too much and not too little. In general, too much and too little of any hormone is bad. You want to be sort of in the middle, maybe even the middle of the range. Um, but um, it's, you know, you don't want to be too high or too low on most, um, on most, uh, most hormones, including thyroid hormone. No, no, I can, again, you know, I com I completely agree. I'm all about moderate because right, good, good. anxiety, depression. I, I, I do not feel people should not have any level of anxiety. You know, you, you right. want to have that emotion. It's a signal to mm -hmm. yourself. Right. And uh, I also wanted to talk about, I mean, just again, so you mentioned TSH, you mentioned uh, T4, T3, I think. Mm -hmm. The bottom line is with all of these these acronyms that we're mentioning, these are all signals that the body is sending throughout the body. Right. right. So, again, if there's too much TSH, that's a sign that there's something going wrong down the line. If there's too little TSH, that's a sign right. that there's something else going on um, down the line. So these are all signals that may or may not be being transmitted properly throughout the body and as mm -hmm. it pertains to the thyroid. Right. Yeah. No, it, it it's fascinating. I, I did not go into uh, anything related to internal medicine, <laughs> mm -hmm. but I have tremendous respect for what you all do. Okay. So that's Hashimoto's and you mentioned the TPO antibody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So can you talk to me about treatment? Of okay. Hashimoto's or, mm -hmm. or hyperthyroidism or hypothyroidism. What, right. what can you tell me so, about so treatment? We'll start with hypothyroidism. Um, so first, again, as we discussed, you have to decide who should get treatment. The higher the TSH is, the more likely I'm to treat somebody. TPO antibody, I'm likely to treat them. If it's positive, it's negative, I'm less likely to treat it. But I look at each patient individually. Somebody with more symptoms, I'm obviously likely to treat. Somebody that was on thyroid medicine in the past, it didn't help them. I'm not sure that it's, I should put it on now if it didn't help them in the past. So I try to, you know, do a careful history. What if they tried thyroid medicines before? Other people, they really helped them a lot. So I'm more likely to put them on. The treatment of for hypothyroid is thyroid uh, hormone, and there's two thyroid hormones the body makes. One is called T4, and one is called T3. The T3 is the active hormone that binds to the thyroid hormone receptor, and it causes you to do all the signals that the thyroid does including control your metabolism, help with your bowels, help with being cold. It's a T3 that's important for that. The T4 is more like the reservoir. It's longer lasting. It gets into the brain better. The T3 doesn't get into the brain that well. And the T4 gets converted to T3. So most endocrinologists in the country give people that are hypothyroid T4, even though the thyroid itself makes both T4 and T3, they just give T4 alone. And they're hoping that the T4 gets converted to T3. And for, you know, probably 85 or 90% of the people in the United States, it works pretty well. Most people with hypothyroidism, they go on T4 treatment or Synthroid or Levoxor or Levothyroxine is the brand name, and they do fine. But there's a growing evidence that a lot of people don't do fine. It's estimated somewhere between 10 to 15% of the people with hypothyroidism that are on T4 don't feel well, and they feel probably worse even than when they started the treatment. And I think in medicine, you, you know, that should jump out at you. You're doing, you know, you're doing something wrong for 10 to 15% of the population. You really should re reassess it. But right. again, mo most endocrinologists still give the T4. But there's a growing reason that, you, the, that you, some people don't do this conversion to T4 to T3 well, and they should get to a T3. Now, T3 has a short half-life. That means it has, it's gone in the body. It has to be given probably twice a day. So it's a little less convenient than the T4 that can be given once a day. Um, so therefore, you know, some endocrinologists, including myself, put people on, especially people that are on T4 and are not doing well, I would put them on T4 plus T3. T3. The T4 could be once a day in the morning, T3 be once a, twice a day, one dose in the morning, a second dose in the afternoon. Some of them do well on that also. But there's another option I want to talk about today that I think is controversial, but um, I think more and more endocrinologists are... Um, are using it, and it's a concept called, it's called natural desiccated thyroid or desiccated thyroid. And this is actually thyroid that comes from pigs. So you're gonna say, Dr. Friedman, are you advocating, you know, people eating pig thyroid? It sounds so unscientific and ancient. That's and you're what right. I'm, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm asking about, what? <laughs> right, exactly, and you're, you're exactly right. So the, uh, the company called, called Armor makes hams, and um, they, had, they didn't wanna give the people 
thyroid from the ham, from the pig. So they took, took it out and they had a surplus of it. So they realized that for people with hypothyroidism, giving the thyroid from the pig is a good treatment for it. So until from maybe 1920 to 1960 or so, that's how we treated hypothyroidism is we gave them pig thyroid from armor. And um, that, that was a successful treatment. In the 60s, um, scientists and endocrinologists realized they can make a synthetic form of thyroid and they made the levothyroxine, the T4 synthetically. And the synthetic was pushed as was more, worked better. It was more scientific, it was more exact. So there was a shift in the country and starting in the sixties to give synthetic synth thyroid medicine, levothyroxine. The main brand was called Synthroid. The Synthroid sponsored a lot of studies, you know, that probably took some endocrinologists out to lunch sometimes. And this, the country shifted to only using Synthroid and T4. That was the way till probably around uh, the 1990s. And then some of the doctors were started realizing that the T4 alone wasn't working well and patients wanted something different. So there was a revival of desiccated thyroid and now it's becoming much more popular. It's more popular, I would say, among more alternative doctors and less popular among mainstream endocrinologists. I try to, to you know, uh, be in both worlds, bridge both worlds. And I use it frequently in patients, and most patients do quite well on it. So the advantage of it, the, synth the synthroid, the T4, is synthetic, just has T4. You can add, as I mentioned, you can add the T3, but you're still missing things that are in the, in the thyroid itself, some of the smaller ingredients in it that may be helpful. And the, um, the, synthroid, the natural desiccated thyroid, again, has these other things in it that has the T4 and T3 in a good ratio. It still does need to be given twice a day. But uh, you know, some of the, a lot of studies, some of the more recent studies have suggested it works at least as well as Synthroid, if not better in certain patients. And certain patients are clamoring for it. They yeah. read about it on the internet, they wanna take it, and they're really excited that I prescribe it. And um, I would say of my patients that I switched from the T4 alone to the desiccated thyroid, at least half of them do better, maybe two thirds of them do better. You know, another percentage do about the same. And a per small percentage do worse, then I would put them back on the T4 switch to T4 to T3. So I think this is a growing option that people that are on T4 and not doing well should discuss with their doctor or come see me and I can put them on it. Well, this is, um, I find that entire story interesting because I think, and we just talked about being a moderate mm -hmm. just a few minutes ago. Right. I don't know if someone that lived on the extremes would be open to trying the other, the other option. Mm -hmm. And have you found that being a moderate, moderate minded in terms of medicine mm -hmm. or life in general has um, has benefited you in any way? Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I really think it's the it's called the golden mean. One of the Jewish um, medieval philosophers named Maimonides, he advocated the golden mean, be a modern everything. I think it's definitely the way life it's, it's my life philosophy. I think it helps me. And I think with endocrinology, I want to be open to different treatments. Um, I think originally, maybe when I was a fellow, I sort of didn't believe that this desiccated thyroid was good, but I see, read more about it. I see patients on it. Patients are asking. Patients are doing quite well on it. And I think you're right. Some patients start having their mind as to what they want to take. They read on the internet. The days of people not looking on the internet are long gone. You know, patients are informed. They read up on things. They sort of, they may have a preconceived idea what they want to go on when they come to see me. A few of them are very against it. Most of them sort of come to see me because they know, they read on the internet about the desiccated thyroid. They know I prescribe it to them. That's one of the reasons why they come to see me. If they have their mind to be on T4, there's plenty of other doctors they can go to um, that can give them the T4. So I think part of it is listening to the patient. They have a good idea what kind of, what kind of treatment they want. And I try to listen to them and try not to uh, twist their arm if they want uh, desiccated thyroid. I'm not going to give them T4 and vice versa. Yeah, it's it's always a balancing act. Obviously, if someone comes in and they they advocate for something, you want to tear them out, and but you mm -hmm. also want to make sure you don't do everything that the that the patient <laughs> that the patient wants. You're right. You're not a pharmacist. You still need to make a clinical decision and work right. within your and clinical I, purview. Right. right. Um, and I try yeah, to I, I agree, man. I decisions. found so much. I, I found much better outcomes being able to uh, to think outside the box with alternative mm -hmm. treatments. Right. Um, and I, I just think outcomes get much better that way. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So absolutely. in, in, I want to make sure that I didn't miss, uh, RT3 was something that you mentioned, right? Was RT3 mentioned in your explanation? 
No. So let me explain that. That's a yes. very good question. It's also so, uh, an area that the alternative doctors are pushing. Mainstream endocrinologists don't really buy it. RT3 is a metabolite of thyroid hormone. It usually goes up when you take T4. When you take T3 or desiccated thyroid that has T3 in it, it goes down. And it was known for many years that RT3, when people are very sick, it goes up. But I think we're realizing now that some people on T4, the RT3 goes up and prevents the T3. Again, that's the active hormone of thyroid from binding to the cell, the receptor, the RT3 blocks that. So you don't want to have too high of an RT3. There's different discussions how high it should be. But I sort of look at the normal range. I like the RT3 to be in the normal range. If somebody is has a high RT3, they'll probably do better adding some T3 or some desiccated thyroid to try to lower it. It hasn't been studied that much. We're looking at it in our series. It seems like the patients that are on the T4 alone have the higher RT3. The people on desiccated or T4 plus T3 have lower. And I think it's better to have lower. So if you have a choice, I try to lower it. And this what, is, again, an area that many endocrinologists don't look at, but I feel it's very crucial. But what exactly is RT3 in relation to T3, T4? Right. Uh, what, what exactly okay. is RT3? Right. So T4 can get metabolized to either T3, the active hormone, or reverse T3, which is inactive hormone, and it blocks the T3 from binding to the receptor. So you don't want to have too much reverse T3. You want to have the T3, which binds the receptor. So if somebody, I do their labs, it's easy to measure the RT3. The lab is very reliable on it. If their RT3 is high, it would encourage me to give them, not take them off T4 or give them less T4 and give them some T3. Sort of the T3 kicks it out and allows the T3 to bind to the receptor and not the reverse T3. Uh, okay. Okay. See, I got it. Yeah. See, even, even me, I, you know, I did medical school too. I need refresher mm -hmm. courses on how the, Absolutely. there's an entire pathway for all of mm -hmm. this. And again, I think right. the theme uh, over the, the past 30 minutes or so for us talking is the balancing act that the body mm -hmm. performs right. on a day-to-day -day right. basis, minute to minute basis, hour to hour basis. It's, it's marvelous. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Yeah, amazing. Yes. But it's a, it's an outright balancing act, and everything that you just described, I mean, that might be just a uh, just a portion of what actually might be going on. We only know a little bit about the body. There's so much more we'd probably right. need to learn. <laughs> exactly, exactly, and that's right. why research is so important. You know, trying to um, undercover new findings, listening to your patients is crucial. I think I learn a lot from my patients, and they tell me that they're doing better on this preparation than another preparation. Yeah. So, I mean, my last question for you is, and this uh, this kind of blends into a, another subject matter. But when we talk about diet mm -hmm. in the United States, right, how does that affect the thyroid and how important is diet in general? Right. So diet in general is crucial. I think as a doctor, you can agree. Yes. Tell me your opinion. We learn very little about diet in medical school. You know, maybe you're lucky you get an hour from a nutritionist that's sort of outdated and gives you sort of old things. You, you you are what you eat, you know, uh, people that eat healthy, I'm convinced they feel better, they're healthier, their thyroid works better. Um, people exercise the same thing. So I spent a lot of my life making sure people try to diet, try to eat healthy. I don't know if I like the word diet, the word as diet has die, D-I-E in it. So I really just tell people eat, eat healthy, eat unprocessed foods, a lot of vegetables and fruit. Rather than telling people what they shouldn't eat, I tell them what they should eat. They should eat a lot of vegetables. My low-income Hispanic and African-American people, they can relate to that. They, rather than tell them to count their calories and buy this and buy that, just tell them eat a lot of vegetables. I think if people eat double their vegetables, they'll do well. Um, you know, Vegetables, no matter what they are, they're healthy for people. Um, so with that in mind, people can't cure their thyroid disease. But you know, I think if they're eating well, they're exercising, they're feeling better overall, their thyroid works better overall. Um, and they do well. I don't recommend a specific type of diet other than what I said about the vegetables. Um, there's some thoughts that too much of what they call a goitrogens, cabbage and kale, they can affect your thyroid. I think that's it's very minor. Soy can affect your thyroid a little bit. It's pretty minor. I think most people just do well if they eat a healthy um, plant-based diet. So in terms of treating hypothyroidism or even hyperthyroidism, mm -hmm. having a good diet is just good for you in Good general. for you, right. Right, right. It's not going to alleviate the use of medicine. If somebody has severe hyperthyroidism, they should go on medicine. If somebody has severe hypothyroidism, but sort of the borderline cases, I think they do well uh, on a healthy diet. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, I think if you if if we could get people to start eating better, that's more mm -hmm. like uh, preventative medicine. Exactly. 
um, than what we have been doing for, I don't know, centuries. Centuries, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Yeah, no. So I, I want to thank you for stopping by. That was all thank the you. questions that I had for you. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Thomas. It was great. Yeah, I had fun. Was there anything else you wanted to? Uh, was there anything else you wanted to bring up? I think so. My website is goodhormonehealth.com. If people want to go on, they want to schedule an appointment with me. You can schedule an appointment online on goodhormonehealth.com. I have a lot of information, a lot of articles, um, web webinars, things like that. Um, you can go on my newsletter, and um, here to help you. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna put uh, all of your all of your information in uh, the description for the podcast and even on YouTube, and uh, you'll you'll be able to go to uh, they'll be able to find your site and everything through there. So, great, yeah, I I think anybody that calls you up and, and seeks assistance is gonna get somebody that's well knowledgeable with thyroid Thank disease so and everything else related to endocrinology. I think that's gonna be clear so today. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, beautiful. Okay, all right. Thank you so much. Bye 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 bye.